Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 11. Uh, today we have uh, Luis Fernando Mises, a voluntarist coming in from Texas. Uh, he, he's a founder of Emancipated Human, Black Markets Are Beautiful, and co founder of V for Voluntary Facebook pages. So today we're going to be uh, discussing um, the recent candidacy of Jeff Berwick, Libertarian Party in Canada, and possibly what, um, if, if it's a good move, if, uh, you know, can we achieve salvation through politics? Is it futile? Um, is there hope in that realm? Or is it just a den of vipers that will eat you up? <laughs> so hopefully not. But uh, so, Luis, why don't you start off? Um, how did you become a, a voluntarist? We'll start there. So how did I become a voluntarist? I guess through um, uh, Ron Paul and uh, some uh, some Pedro cactus and some ayahuasca. Um, and um, <laughs> that will do it. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's kind of funny. But we can we can expand on that later on. Uh, but uh, basically, that's that's uh, in a nutshell how it happened. And um, I think you know, like looking back, I can I remember my mom always telling me, uh, you know, uh, the philosophy of uh, yeah, I'm willing to do anything as long as uh, it's not expected of me. You know, I will be willing to help. I'll be willing to do. But the moment it becomes my obligation, I will not do it. And now she gets surprised when I tell her that I'm an anarchist. <laughs> um, I was like, Mom, you, I mean, basically, you taught me that stuff. Um, so uh, the, <laughs> it's funny. But, 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 but there's an exception, though, okay? You can't apply that universally. Come on, what kind of person are you? Morally consistent? I learned it from you, <laughs> Mom! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that... no, I mean, she, she, I guess she still sees me like a little kid, so she's kind of like, you know, pats me on the back, and she's like, whatever, <laughs> go on, go play. Go play on your computer. Go 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 go! Yeah. Argue it with idiots on the internet. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Family members never seem to take people seriously. I guess that's the the most difficult people to uh, talk to. Even even like if you're a medical practitioner like me, uh, they say family family members are the most difficult patients, right? Because <laughs> they'll never take your advice unless someone else of an equal, you know, um, I guess education will tell you the exact same thing and then they're going to say, you know what, they have a point. <laughs> I just told you that. Yeah. Well, fortunately, like my relatives do sort of listen to me. So that's kind of neat. Like they're oh, like, good. you know, when there's like the ph philosophical kind of uh, political stuff, they're like, oh, well, what do you think about it? Since you're a geek in the, like, I mean, they, they <laughs> point it out kind of like a sarcastic remark. But, it, I mean, they do end up listening. So you are the politician of the family. What do you think? <laughs> the politician. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what my parents and, and my family are. You're too into politics. I'm like, I'm not into politics. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm into non-politics. <laughs> or, uh, or I get, I get like, um, the anarchist is like the, uh, the party favor. Oh, so let's ask the anarchist what he thinks about <laughs> health care, the new health care reform or, you know, the new foreign policy or whatever crap. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, it it gets interesting. It's kind of funny sometimes. I think um, my niece's husband, we were talking about it and uh, that we were homeschooling our kids. And I was trying to persuade him to do the same with, you know, theirs. And I talked about the Ron Paul curriculum. He's like, wait a minute, did you just say Ron Paul? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's kind of kind of neat to like plant seeds of liberty. Nice. Hey, we trademark. That's a copyrighted <laughs> term, right? <laughs> no. Don't even start with that copyright. Just kidding. Stuff. Just kidding. That is my no. intellectual property. I'm and I'll soon <laughs> see you in court, sir. Wait, we're on the show. Never mind. You said it on the show. Don't say it anywhere else, or you know, you'll be you know, speaking with my lawyer. Sarah is my my attorney on intellectual yeah, property. Right. So. Yeah, right. I saw that. That's a good one. Yeah. Are we are we covered by the bip cut? <laughs> <laughs> We are, we are now, but that's not going to stop. That's not going to stop them. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so uh, Luis, why don't you tell us how, about your experience in, uh, in the Libertarian Party? And how's, how's that going? Are, are you still involved in it? Yes, and actually, we have an event right after this interview. Uh, the chair, unfortunately, uh, he got some sort of uh, weird ass brain uh, tumor that cannot be removed. So we're going to go celebrate his life. Uh, he was given uh, 18 months left to live. Mm. So um, uh, just a big hug to Alan. I'm going to go see him in a minute. Have, um, you, um, 
have you read about uh, changing the alkalinity in your body to make it uninhabitable by tumors? I've been reading about that. It's pretty insane. Yes, I have. Um, and actually, um, uh, well, I guess there are some things I cannot say here. <laughs> but um, some, he, he may be getting some help on, on some oils of some sort. So hopefully cool. he'll, he'll uh, something nice will happen. I mean, we're kind of, uh, I mean, we're still ho hopeful. Ho ho hopefully something that's not FDA approved, right? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> well, at, at this point, I'm sure it's whatever, whatever can help will be will be yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you know? yeah. yeah. We so could rant about the FDA exactly. for hours. <laughs> at, 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 oh yeah, at, no, at, stop. that'd be a good topic for another, <laughs> another for time. another time. Yeah. So like these people, uh, they're they're fascinating. They're awesome, and they know I'm an anarchist, and they support me. And whenever they're like, so we need a speaker for this uh, event that's going to happen sometime soon, and I'm like, well, I have some friends here. You know, I actually contacted. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker and he gave me some quotes and I gave them to them and I was like but all my friends are anarchists if they if you want speakers they're gonna be anarchists they're like that's okay we like that you know so I mean they're super open they're very supportive they're not like they're real libertarians they're not right-wing tea party people you know faking out being libertarians they're really nice people and you know we have a common goal which is I mean I Here's where I kind of connect with Rothbard a little bit when he said that um, we ought to use the Libertarian Party as a tool and not see it as an enemy. And sure, I'm an anarchist, and some people will like make fun of the idea that you know voluntarists or anarchists are using the political system. But I, 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 don't, I guess I don't see it necessarily as a way to win power, but I see it more kind of like with the idea of edu educating uh, more people from different angles. So, you know, for instance, uh, at work, that's kind of what we teach. We teach voluntarism in the corporate world. And then, you know, on, on my activism, like you guys do, we do this, you know, uh, anarchism here on the internet. And, you know, I, I do it with Jeff Berwick. We write the, uh, I collaborate with a uh, dollar vigilante, uh, which is only $15 a month if you want to buy it. Um, and, you know, then the political arena, which is, you know, we help people see that there are inconsistencies in the political process and how uh, Republicans and Democrats are nothing but socialist and socialist light. So I don't see it as a way of uh, like um, trying to get power or be in power, but more like empower people. And, and funny enough, you know, like recently us here in the Libertarian Party in Tarrant County, we just got rid of the red light cameras through political action. So there was some um, shenanigans and, and, you know, obviously those guys are just doing some sort of a favoritism, uh, corporatism, and they put those cameras in. And funny enough, you know, I've gotten like several tickets and I've never paid them and they don't even go in your record. So, I mean, there it, it's some shady stuff there. So, and I, I just don't pay them, you know? I mean, whatever. What are they going to do? They don't even go in your record. So we, uh, the party, uh, we got together and uh, we did a bunch of uh, work and, and collected signatures until we put it in the ballot. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we voted on it and they're out. They're out. So, they're, I mean, it's passed. And, and within the next couple of weeks, they're going to come down. And, and that's, that's a nice victory for us. And that's just one example out of many things, you know, like we have a friend that, that moved from the Libertarian Party to uh, she became a lobbyist in the marijuana uh, uh, decriminalization. So she's doing a lot of work there also to uh, help people understand uh, the uh, benefits of this plant, because um, it has much more benefits than just, you know, recreational drug. Uh, and I don't even see it as a recreational drug. I see it more of a sacrament, but I mean, everybody sees it different, differently. But the idea that we can get a lot of work done through um, uh, teaching and, uh, and, and helping people understand things, I, I think that's pretty valid. What do you guys think? Well, I, I can see the, uh, the benefits of it. Um, you know, lis listening to, to your story, um, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, well, it, I, I think it really depends on where you are, you know, and the particular libertarian party that surrounds you. You know, I, I'm in New York, and I was a member of the local libertarian party until I 
decided that I just didn't want to play the game anymore, and I, I, I you know, resigned myself to calling uh, myself a full-blown anarchist. Yeah. Um, and my local party here, you know, the county party here, which was extremely small, uh, you know, the meetings usually had like 10 people at most for a while. Um, they, they were all pretty cool. You know, most of them were, were the older generation. Um, a lot of them were either anarchists that were in the closet or borderline anarchists. Um, but they kept insisting on putting people, trying to put people on the local ballot every cycle. Um, so when I joined up, they convinced me to run for office, even though I was pretty much at the end of my rope with, with statism. Uh, um, but I decided to go for it. Um, but the local, the local party is good, but the state party overall is a nightmare because the, the infighting that goes in there, the mudslinging, and it's, a, it's, it's all power plays. So most of those guys consider themselves libertarians, but they'd be closer to what you were describing earlier, you know, the Tea Party-esque Republicans who want to claim the libertarian label. Um, for one issue or two, but they're not consistent at all. Um, that's who runs the, you know, the state party here. Um, but uh, when you have the the better groups, the ones that are, you know, like like you said, they they can accomplish stuff like that. So I don't begrudge people for doing that. It's just not for me anymore. Um, you know, I, I look at somebody like you, and I'm like, go for it. You know, you know, Ber Berwick actually caught a lot of flack as soon as he made the announcement for the same reasons. You know, where you were saying people are like, oh, you're 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 trying to play the game, and you know, if if he wants to get in there, or anybody wants to get in there and, and get really involved to the point of tr trying to become a candidate, you know, more power to him. Like I said, it's just not for me because um, I tried that, and I got to see the underbelly of local politics, where the you know the Republicans and the Democrats colluded to keep us off the ballot altogether, you know, for local position, like little, you know, I was running for county clerk. <laughs> I knew nothing about the job. I was running on the platform that I wanted to ab abolish the position altogether, or at the very least cut my salary and the entire staff salary and the budget down to the least, you know, almost zero. <laughs> um, so obviously I wasn't allowed to talk in any debates or anything. They made sure I wasn't even allowed to play the game. Um, but like I said, if, if people want to go for it, I, I see it as it, it can help. Um, in that respect of, of getting the little laws passed. Personally, I just try to opt out. So I also, like you, don't pay the, the tickets like that. Um, but unfortunately, up here, I learned that after you don't pay them for a while, then they send you to collections and they start charging you more money. <laughs> Still doesn't go on your driving record, but uh, I've, been having, I've been getting threatening letters for a while now saying that uh, you know, my credit's going to be damaged. Uh, not that I really care about that, <laughs> um, so they'll try to get you any which way. But. No, there was a there was a guy in Texas or Illinois who, like, intentionally ran like thirty red lights to see if he could get away with not paying him. Uh, <laughs> and his proof in court was that there was no officer there to witness the, uh, you know, witness the uh, crime being committed. Uh, and he won, and they took all the red light cameras out of his city, and. Uh, yeah, basically, someone has to come testify for you in court. If the red light camera was taking people or putting people there in court, they would have to be an officer. So therefore, the red light company would have to therefore start hiring officers to testify, and it would just cost. They would lose money instead of make money. So and plus, wrecks and accidents go up on those red light intersections like fivefold once they put them there. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, and and I. You know, mine are, I have a couple in uh, collection too, and, and I'm, what are they going to do, you know? Like you said, I mean, it, it really doesn't affect me. Um, so, yeah, we're doing a lot of things, and I'm sure that Jeff Berwick is going to be able to, I mean, he has a really big, um, there's a lot of people that follow him, so that's really mm -hmm. awesome. And and, and uh, his reach is so so vast that he will be able to, uh, even grow it more as he steps into the uh, political arena in, in Canada. Um, uh, is so, he going to campaign from Acapulco, or is he going to move back to Canada? <laughs> you know, that's actually something that I'm yeah, wondering. I'm wondering. <laughs> uh, yeah, because um, he doesn't like the cold weather. So, um, hmm. you know, after living in paradise for like five years, even when we when he came here to Texas, we were in Austin, and it was probably like. I don't know, 56 degrees. He was hating it so much. <laughs> wow. He was hating it, yeah. So that's my um, favorite weather. <laughs> right. 
when you get to live and work at the beach every day, I guess it's kind of hard to come anywhere else. <laughs> I know, yeah. So it it was a bit interesting. So I don't know if you'll go back there or not for this. I'll have to ask him, and then we can talk about that later. But I I, I think that um, what I find interesting is that the people that tend to be uh, most um, critical towards this kind of work are people that don't get really anything done. You know, they're just there. You know, I see two things. Uh, people that are just um, not really doing anything about anything and they just see you doing these kinds of things and they they, they call bullshit on you. And then there's like, um, you know, the term new rich, right? So when somebody recently becomes rich, suddenly they buy, try to buy the best of everything and, and whatever. So I, I think that there's such a thing as new anarchist or new mm -hmm. Rothbardian, if you will. You know, oh, how in the hell do you think you're going to be doing this political work? You're not an anarchist. You're, you're not, you know, I don't believe in purism because um, I mean we we all I mean, it's kind of impossible you know um, but we do the best we can so I think the idea that we cannot and should not meddle and, and just uh, be involved in this political stuff is like you said it may not be for some people you know we cannot claim higher uh, moral ground here so whatever you're doing for the service of yourself and those around you I think that should be pretty pretty awesome and not necessarily to like you said, to change power, but just to try to educate people and, and, and minimize the power of the state. I used to be, um, you know, the, the, the Molyneux uh, the belief that, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, if, if you want to enter politics to change government, you know, it's first start with, like, first start small, like KKK, you know, try to turn that into a black brotherhood and, you know, things like that. And I, and I, and I thought like that for a while. Um, but then you know, now that I'm hearing more people going into, you know, um, the Libertarian Party in various uh, places to try to affect change inside, um, it's uh, I think I've changed a little bit because, like you said, it's it's I think that's the um, the no true Scotsman fallacy, right? <laughs> You're not a true anarchist if you go into politics. But, um, you know, that's not true. And I think and I think, uh, you know, like you said, Luis, you know, we can all do good. You know, you engage in the you know black market or agorism or barter or you know precious metals or um, um, you know thing, things like that and and it's, it's it's about you know being morally consistent. It's about how you treat people around you. You know, I think that's what makes you a real voluntarist. Um, and if you choose to try to enter politics to affect change, uh, yeah, like like uh, like one of his uh, recent, I think it was Daryl Perry, he was saying that that's what people like every four years people pay attention to politics, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of the time they don't. And so perhaps we could use that to spread ideas that they would normally never listen to, right? Or consider, right? Because people are actually paying attention and that's pretty valuable, right? So, you know, and, 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 and you know, over time it, it can become an echo chamber <laughs> of, our, of us if we continue, you know, uh, just, you know, on the internet or Facebook groups or, uh, uh, you know, just these videos, right? Um, so, you know, you really want to get out there, you go into politics, but um, yeah, again, like Jeremy said, it's not for me. <laughs> I've never been in the Libertarian Party, but um, yeah, it's not for me, not, not my style. So, but again, I applaud and encourage uh, and wish the people who do try all the best because um, I think that when we can attack the state at all, um, from all angles, from all perspectives, that's also really valuable, right? Like we each do our separate thing and each, each of us together can um, affect really positive change and bring down the state uh, much quicker <laughs> than, than normal. I absolutely agree, and I think that's pretty powerful. And, and just to pay attention, and not necessarily call it politics, but call it your life, you know? I mean, like the fact that these guys are trying to rule you and trying to basically tell you what you can and cannot do. Um, I'm also uh, part of the Discordians, and, and like the idea of Discordianism is um, liberty is uh, what you can get away with. So, in other words, uh, no cop, no stop, you know, like, I mean, obviously with the idea that you're going to um, not hurt other people. So, I mean, because a lot of people say, oh, it's going to be chaos, it's going to be whatever. No, no, no. The whole idea is do as thou wilt, but be prepared to pay the consequences. And And I think that that releases and relieves any kind of pressure from anything you know you just do what you need to do to be happy to pursue your happiness and your liberty and and, and if that means uh, you want to eat 
17 pounds of pizza that's whatever i mean that's your choice although i would probably not counsel for that you know <laughs> some people may want to use something else but i mean that whatever right so so here comes my contrary position on this whole thing thank you for that i um <laughs> i'm not a big all right so if you're if you're going into the libertarian party and your entire prime objective is to change minds, spread voluntarism, anarchy, whatever you want to call it, uh, a non-coercive life, um, good, do that. But if your intentions are winning it, gaining political power, building things up to do, like, you know, force everyone to accept this ideology or whatnot. Uh, Gary Johnson was the governor of, what, New Mexico, and, like, shit didn't even change the whole time he was there. I mean, drugs are still illegal there. Um, the police state in New Mexico is one of the largest per capita police states. So obviously, fruitless endeavor, in my opinion. Um, if you put all that effort more into uh, your own close-knit community, your friends, your family, those people then do the same thing to their friends and their family, and it spreads that way. Well, I kind of disagree a little bit because I actually have researched um, his uh, his uh, political career, and um, he uh, vetoed and did not allow tons of laws to go into uh, full effect. So any other quote normal, you know, statist would have just agreed and keep signing laws into effect, but he didn't. Well, he and just also, delayed it. Um, well, if you're, if you, I think, honestly, here's here's the catch. You cannot, your vote doesn't really count beyond the local level. So I will give you that much. You know, beyond like getting, you know, action done in your local level, your vote doesn't count. Now, with that said, how much can he do? How much is he allowed to do? You know, like he's really not allowed to do, or or anybody for that matter, like basically... I have some relatives in, in politics and uh, public works and all that jazz and my, my I, I cannot say names or relationships, but this person would get the green light or the red light from his boss to whom they should give um, contracts to. So this person in government, even though somebody else would make it a little cheaper or probably better quality uh, this person was not allowed to say yes to, to, to a better um, contractor so it's called this fascism person, exactly so and this person was in a high position of power you know the director of public works of a really big city so if you cannot do that you know then what can you do so in other words like again you, you really have no power people that go for those things you're just going I mean, Jesus, they're getting like $175,000 a year as, as a state representative. I mean, even in, in, in really expensive cities, that's a lot of money, yeah. you know? So, and just for kind of hanging out and, and playing with your phone and voting yes and no, you know? I mean, even the Constitution said that these people should not hold, I mean, they're not supposed to be career politicians. You know, you go to work and you do your thing and then you go whenever session's on. So, I mean, it is kind of a little bit of a scam, and that's kind of what we're trying to also yeah, let people know. I had like, lunch with one of my, uh, when I was uh, big in the Tea Party and the conservatives in Alabama, I had lunch with my local state senator, uh, not the, uh, you know, not the one that goes to the Capitol, but the one that is in Alabama, and and I told him that I would no longer ever be supporting him because he voted for the, and he Vi he co-wrote the bill to increase uh, Alabama state senator, congr uh, state senate pay, uh, from thirty thousand to fifty-eight thousand, I think. Um, and I said, "You're not hurting for money. I know exactly where you live. I I've seen your house. I've seen your car. <laughs> you get paid by your lobbyist." I, I sit there and told him all this. I said, "You get paid by your lobbyist. You get paid from your campaign. You get paid by the church and the." city of commerce where you live there's no way that you need this extra twenty thousand dollars this is not going to affect your life in any way and he was like well we just did agree to disagree and i'm sitting here telling this to a state senator 
And I'm like, you know, it's people, you know, I used to be a big supporter of his, and I said, it's people like you that you get into politics for the right reason, and then you completely warp your entire body and your, the way you think. And it's no longer about how much can I help my community. It's about how much can I help myself. And, you know, that's the problem with politics is it's almost like a drug. I mean, if you could push a button and every time you push that button you get $20,000, you're going to push that button until you pass out every day. So, well, it's, Yeah, it's, and it's, I don't disagree. I, I like that. Yeah, well, it's it's the power. I mean, I mean, like like Luis is saying, and, and I said too, and I mean, Dave, you even agreed with that. That you know, if if your purpose is education, then yes, run for office if that so you know if you so decide to do that, and uh, even if you do get in, continue that. But it's the people that get in um, for the right reasons, even somebody who may want want to limit the government to absolutely nothing. Um, they stick around long enough and it's that that addiction to power that just gets to them and that that's the one thing that i when i get into debates with with other people about you know the effectiveness of politics and you know to to whatever extent it's to me you know like with ram paul last night with his big um you know another filibuster which was you know all, all over social media everybody you know Dog and pony show. yeah but so-called libertarians um real actual small l libertarians and even some anarchists that i know you know they're all standing with Rand because you know he's going to do this and he's going to do that and it's like well to me somebody like him has already compromised his principles numerous times you know he won everybody a lot of people's hearts with the last filibuster about drones and then a couple weeks later i think it was that he came out with the you know oh they're okay to use you know Domestically, though, for if somebody's saying robbing a liquor store, it's like, how is that consistent on any level? You know, so other than his father, I call it defensive support. Well, yeah, but <laughs> you don't, you don't. Other than other than Rand's father, Ron, you don't see hardly any politicians on any level anywhere that well, stick to their principles the entire time. And once you let go, <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to play devil's advocate, Jeremy. Uh, Obama, if you had to sit down Obama on a uh, polygraph and ask him his political beliefs, you know, make him take a political test truthfully, he would probably come out stone cold communist, right? But when he was campaigning, he was anti-war, all this, I'm going to shrink the size of this, I'm going to do that, and, and it was all lies because he did none of that. So for Rand Paul, he has to play the populist, right? Like there's I, no way you can tell me that Rand Paul wasn't read Rothbard when he was a teenager, like by I'm, Ron, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying from what I've seen from him, you know, to, like I said, to me, this is this is my opinion. When you once you let go of your principles, once you start to play the game, um, and you become inconsistent in your philosophy just in order to play the game, it it does statistically make it that much easier to do the next time around and the next time around and the next time around. And I'm not saying Rand, this is what's going to happen to Rand, but you see it happen all the time. You know, I've known local politicians personally that I met when they were first going into office and they were, you know, I knew these people. They were, you know, I, I talked to them enough. They were, you know, good people. They really had those great intentions. And once they went in, you know, my local congressman, for, for instance, he went in and he was he was a really nice guy and he, he really wanted to you know make things better. And I actually believed him. You know, this was years ago when I was was still into, you know, when I was still a statist. But they he he ended up voting for the SAFE Act, which up here in New York was, you know, Cuomo's big thing right after Sandy Hook because he wanted to put his name on the map um, and beat out everybody else to have the, the best gun laws possible. Um, and they rushed it through in the middle of the night, literally. Like I have, just because I was a member of the Oath Keepers at that point, I happened to be on alert for that stuff. And they literally signed the bill into into law at like 1 a.m. in the morning on a Wednesday night. Um, and uh, he, like 
Cuomo waived the three day waiting waiting period that he usually takes for at least you know for every other bill he takes at least the three days that he's supposed to. Um, he rushed it through, and my senator, my congressman, was one of them. And when I went to go talk to him the next time, he just looked at me and shook his head. It's like, well, you know, I I kind of regret that, but I had to. And I, like I I asked him about his principles at that point, and, and he looked away from me, and he did, he really he all of a sudden he had another meeting he had to attend. And it's like I, you see it happen, and that's that's the scary part. You know, a lot of these guys, even the long-term ones, um, they didn't start out like that. Most of them did start out with wanting to help their community, and it's just once you get that position of power, um, and you are put in a separate class of citizens than the rest of us. Oh yeah, it, become, I mean, it becomes a lot harder to resist that temptation, and then, like I said, once you know, and but even on the other hand, like you know, Luis, you're saying about you know the people you know and how the people you know the people over them are like, no, you have to do this. You don't really have a choice in the matter. Like, there's that angle too. So it's like I said, if you're going in for educational purposes, and you know you're somebody like like what I did, like you run on a platform of wanting to do, take things down, um, great. But if you're if you're going in there to play the game, uh, like I said, you, you, if you just look at the history, people get burned way too often playing that. You know, it's it's dangerous to, to get into that angle. Absolutely, I think that um, I can't remember where I read it, but um, whenever you know you're in a situation of power, um, I think you know a lot of people say, "Oh, people, uh, power changes people, and money changes people." Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's true at all. I think that what happens is it really brings out the true you so uh i think you know and the same thing happens for instance when people drink alcohol you know like if uh, some people get witty and, and some people pass out some people get angry so whatever it's already inside of you comes out with like you know power money and, and you know alcohol so i i would even consider that maybe that person like maybe not this person but some people that go into politics with the idea to change the world and they come out as just as bad as the other guys, you know, it's probably because to start, they had something inside that really was not fully, um, just with um, consistent, I suppose. And, and and we can, I mean, I cannot sit here and blame people because, you know, all of us have something that we're not consistent at. But the idea is that these guys, you know, they're playing with like the future of our children and, and, and more than that. So, I mean, it gets stickier. If it was just their own life, then it will be their own thing, but they're playing with fire there. So, I mean, yeah, it's not for everybody. And I don't think that everybody should just go ahead and, you know, do that. And, but I, I think that there is a time and a place for it. When, when some people um, talk to me about politics and they, you know, they ask me, what do you think, Daniel, should I, should I run for politics? You know, is, is, it, is there a chance that we can make a change? I always tell them the quote, um, sending in a good man to reform the state is like sending in a virgin to reform the whorehouse. That was one of my favorite quotes for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think I would really encourage anyone to go into politics um, as like the first thing to do um, to affect change. Maybe, <laughs> you know, I, I have many other things before that. Um, but um, the, the other thing I have a problem with is, like, like Jeremy was saying, you know, the, the dishonesty. So, so if we all accept that politicians lie, right, like that's just commonplace. You know, the, another thing I tell people is that the only, the only two, two types of people that can consistently lie and keep their jobs are meteorologists and politicians, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and it, it's, it's amazing how Lawyers. often <laughs> – yeah, right. It's amazing how often politicians lie – and it's just swept under the rug. It's forgotten the next day. It's not a big deal. It really is amazing. And, and like you said, Luis, it's, politics is so um, influential in people's lives, not only now, the, people, you know, the freedom of people now, but our future you know, kids and grandkids, um, their, the quality of their lives, the, the, you know, um, you know, they're, they're, what they're going to be able to, to um, enjoy you know, it's going to affect all that. So it's it's really a very powerful force in a lot of people's lives, right? And for politicians to lie so much, and then for people to just forgive them so much, and and then you know, of course, have all of the uh, 
you know, all the, uh, like, you know, the drone strikes and the assassinations, the occupations, the invasions, and all the, you know, the war on terror and all the people that die. And it, again, like, it's just glossed over, you know, you know, you just, you know, people laugh at their jokes and they don't, they don't consider that these people are mass murderers on a grand scale, right? Like another, another one of my favorite quotes is by Aesop. Um, he says, we, um, you know, we, we, uh, we hang the, the, the petty thieves and we appoint the great ones to office, right? <laughs> because, so true. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and it's just amazing how often they're able to lie with a straight face and just, you know, <laughs> continue to do it and deceive and, you know, and manipulate. It's just, it's just, it's just really amazing. So, so it's, it's very difficult for me to, um, you know, to, to believe that somebody can go in such high positions of power and, and maintain that integrity, right? And if you really can, I applaud you, but I don't think many people can, you know, I, I really don't. And, uh, and like, you know, and another thing, uh, J.R. Tolkien, you know, the, the, um, well, he says something like, uh, you know, I don't trust people who, who, uh, you know, in positions of power and even less the people who, who strive to achieve positions of power. <laughs> but, um, but again, if, if, again, if your intention is to spread a message, right, not wield power, like, uh, you know, like, like um, Adam Kokesh, you know, he's on the, 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 uh, the platform of peaceful dissolution of the federal government, you know, hopefully happen, you know, but it's just, uh, it's just so difficult to conceive given the fact that we're such be an enormous, an enormous <laughs> imperialistic empire. Yeah, that's the other thing. I'm really afraid for people that go into those, those high positions of power and really try to do that. Like, are they really just going to allow them to, like, bring all the troops home, you know, nullify the NDAA, the Patriot Act, all the gun laws, <laughs> you, know, you know, dismantle the CIA, the FBI, dismantle all. Like, how easy is that going to be, you know? And uh, I don't know. It's those, just, are, those are I have all a lot created. Of questions. All the... All the things that end with an A or whatever, FDA, CIA, whatever, they were all created through executive order. Uh, they're funded by the Congress, so all you'd have to do is make a, an executive order repealing the executive orders that created those those departments, and they would cease to exist. Congress well, funding... I think that what uh, Danilo says is pretty right on, because honestly, I don't think that the president really has the power to just say, okay, you know, this is over. Because uh, there's like, you know, the black budgets that go in and then all the people that are really in power moving the strings. I mean, yeah, there is there is the idea that I think Doug Casey was telling me that even if Ron Paul had been uh, the president, you know, they would probably sit him down, you know, the director of the CIA and director of the FBI and show him a PowerPoint presentation and tell him <laughs> this is what you can do and this is what you cannot do. You know, so and then show the JFK assassination, and this will, <laughs> might happen. <laughs> exactly. So I even think that um, I mean I've, I've only met Ron Paul once, and I never really got to talk to him. I just tell him I love you so much, Ron Paul. You woke me up, and he says, "Well, you look pretty awake to me." Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, you know, like the idea that I think he was just running for a pure uh, educational purpose. I don't think he really was. I mean, and how many? people that he wake up he, he woke me up you know i mean he's in uh, tons of people um and and on that regard like my dad uh, back in mexico at some point he was a director of public transportation of mexico city and uh whenever um i mean this is everywhere not just in mexico um like whenever they the contractors came to um you know um change the transmissions and all of that the motors for for the buses and and whatever um, uh, one of the contractors uh, brought my dad a case uh, full of money and he says, uh, this is your half. All I'm going to do is wash the transmissions and put them back on and they're going to look new. So because the, the public, you know, tax money, the, the contractor will get paid and my dad in that position would get his cut for giving that, um, I guess, that grant or whatever. So... Um, yeah, you know, and in Mexico, it's a little different. They, you take the money or you take the bullet. <laughs> well, it's not so different here, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not saying it's that much different here. It's not as, as blatant as it is in Mexico. Uh, so, you know, my, my mom tells me this story that my dad came home and he basically, like, got the runs because he was, like, so freaked out by this situation. And, like, the next day he put in his notice because his boss told him, you know, if you're not going to take this money, you're not cut out for this kind of work. So uh, he was 
on relentless and he would not bend his you know his his i guess anarchist voluntary mm -hmm. will so he he left and and i guess that's just a story that's kind of stuck in my head because like the idea that we you know like he could have received millions you know and and just continue this sort of thing but it's not what he was made of you know like uh, and and it, I was able to learn right there, you know, like the idea of, okay, you could be like uber rich and, and, but I mean, out of what, out of like thievery and, and, you know, fake stuff and just robbing people's money. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's maybe those, there's people in, in government that are good people and, and they end up leaving and nobody ever knows about that. You know, to your point, and you know that you know you were saying that maybe those people don't exist. I think they do exist, but they just leave because they can't handle that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, those those are the people you never hear about. But that you know, I mean, now with the the advent of the internet and all the alternative media, you, you're starting to see some more stories. You know, there are some whistleblowers. I hate to use that term, but you know that's what they're classified as. And in, in different aspects of government, um, have come to light now, and you see that more often. But it's still, I'm sure, it's still severely underreported because even those good people that leave because they can't, they can't bring themselves to do it. And, and good on your dad, man. That that's that's incredible. Like you're right. I don't. There's not a lot of people out there like that. But when you find them, that's that's a good person right there. That's willing to give up that easy money for, for their principles. But those people that do come out, I, I'm sure the number is still, you know, what people know is still very underreported because of the fear factor, because even the people that leave because they can't take it, they also don't want to speak up because once you get inside and see the underbelly, you know, you realize what the people at the top are really capable of, you know, and if, if they're willing to steal millions of dollars you know from well i mean they're, they're worthless dollars at this point but st steal the steal the real wealth from from millions of people just for their own benefit you know what aren't they going to be willing to do so that it's, it's a shame because those people they, they just fade into the woodwork and, and they don't want any more trouble um, and then the next crop goes in and and the ones that do stick around are willing to play the game at least a little bit and, you know and then they end up becoming career politicians that are there for 20 30 40 uh, it's, it's sickening that some people have been in certain offices for even more than even more than 10 years like some of them 30 40 years it's just disgusting because you know um no matter what outward appearances put they put on you don't even have to dig very deep to find that they've just been rolling in the dough for 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 decades yeah obama's um, wealth what went up 800 percent when he became president Seriously? Well, yeah, he was well, worth 80 million and now he's worth 800 million. <laughs> no, but even before he became a president, he only had like 3 or 4 million dollars, you know? Well, no, and, he I mean, before he became a president, we're talking about before he got inaugurated because he had all the money from the campaign. Yeah. But uh I want to ask a question. I want to see what you guys feel about this. Uh what is the core of libertarianism? Luis? Are you a well, I mean, when you say... What's the core belief of libertarianism? I... I think the idea that basically live and let live, you know? I mean, is that not... Well, it's to be against the initiation of violence. Yeah. Okay, so what is voting? Uh... I don't disagree. <laughs> yeah, so, well, well they, they, it's all right. Dave and I can argue about this. We, we, no, no, we, no. <laughs> like, we need contrarian talk on this this program. And my contention is that you cannot claim yourself to be a libertarian and be for any form of government. I will because have to agree. At, because you, oh, you okay. can't be. Because to be a libertarian, to claim yourself to be a libertarian, you have to be against the initiation of force. All government has to steal. No, I, to be for it is one thing, but you started off with the voting aspect, and and uh, well, we, voting we have, is force, forcing your neighbors. We, we have we have talked about this before, and, and and I I'm in the Spooner camp on this, where you you can't make that blanket statement because if you put that scenario, if you're a slave on a plantation and the master gives you the opportunity to vote for le for less whippings and better meals, are you now consenting and are you now part of the violence because you vote for that? 
absolutely not. If you, you so you you can't make that blanket statement that that but what if voting is violent. This... People who vote and think they're going to change, yes, they may be misguided. But if you're going to be say voting, like you know, as Luis said earlier, that it really only matters on like a, the local level. See, if you're if you're voting for ballot measures and not for politicians, then that is that, that yes, you can call it violence if you want, but you're you're doing something to not only better your own situation but everybody's situation outside of the ruling class. Um, everybody's situation. If you're voting against a ballot measure or for a ballot well, measure, to get like red camera, red light cameras taken out of your jurisdiction, um, to have like local drug ordinances lifted, you know, anything like that, that to me, that that's not a violent act. That's that's self-preservation right there. And you know, like I said, I, in in the in the general terms, yes, I understand what you're saying, but I, I just don't think you can make that a blanket statement. Because you're ignoring all these other nuances. I'm not making a necessary blanket statement. I'm just trying to make a factual statement. And at, at, on top of this, you're also negating the fact that on a large majority, slaves believe that they should be slaves and that the authority of their master was just and, and, and virtuous. But that's irrelevant to the analogy I brought up. I, I understand that's irrelevant. But your, your thing is, it, would you vote for better food and better housing less to weapons. sleep in, less whippings? There are some slaves that would say to you that you're incorrect, that master should feed us what he wants and whip us as much as we want because he's our property, or our, we are his property. Sure, but 99 million people could say something to one person, and if they're morally wrong, they're still morally wrong. It doesn't matter what they say. I'm talking about the actual, you know, br breaking down to the, to the, you know, the lowest level here. It's, like I said, it's... it's I, the way you put it, the way you bring it up every time, to me, it just sounds like a blanket statement. So not all voting is violence. If you're voting with the intent purpose of getting your guy into office so his new laws get passed and your will is now imposed on other people, then yes, absolutely. That, to me, that's, a, that's an act of aggression. But if your sole purpose for voting is to vote on ballot measures or see, say if we to could vote only vote with our dollar, if there was, if if government was a capitalist found foundation, <laughs> if we could just say, I'll pay my taxes, but I'm only going to pay but, into but, this. <laughs> but that's an oxymoron. If government was for profit, it wouldn't be government; it would be a private enterprise, right? <laughs> You're assuming I, I, that government isn't a private enterprise at this point. Well, no, it's just no, an no. arm of the the Federal Reserve at this point. Well, I mean, there are some entities that are the for-profit part of government. You know, a lot of people complain about private um, jails and uh, all this stuff. But in reality, it's not like, I mean, it's only the for-profit part of the government, but it's not really private. It's not the free market. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a, like, what would it be? Like some form of neo-fascism of sorts? No, no, so no, no, no need that, to put neo in front of it. It is fascism. Yeah, that's... What Dave's favorite word, and I ha and I have to agree with him on this one. It absolutely is. the whole system is, um, because there is there is no free market. There's never been a free market. As soon as government interferes, the free market process has been destroyed. Um, it's yeah, been co-opted. I mean, just the idea that for you know for trade to happen, we have to have this socialized money. You know that already is meddling in the free market, and 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 uh, kind of fucking with um, the worth of your money and. Uh, and, and the supply of it, so I mean, it, it, right off the bat, so Danilo's happy you mentioned money. <laughs> so, Danilo's favorite topic. <laughs> well, no, I was right? gonna say, I was gonna say that uh, y it's it's very unfortunate that um, you know that's one of the things that people attack, like you know um, Monsanto and you know um, Chevron and BP and these in these huge uh, you know special interest groups. They say you know they they just care about the money. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about the people. <laughs> I'm like I'm like. That's what a private business is. They care about the money. If they don't, if they don't have a profit, they're gonna go under. You know, they're gonna go bankrupt. So the evil thing is not profit. The evil thing is is association with the monopoly on violence, right? It's you know um, destroying competition at the most basic level, and you know employing regulations that will benefit, you know, its uh, its protection, right? That's the evil part. The evil part is not the money or the profit. That's people. It's it's so unfortunate that people vilify money. Um, you know, when it's when when it's just a slight bit is associated with uh, you know with with the uh, you know special interest group, <laughs> it's it's just you know I I, read, I saw a good uh, a good meme you know there you know if if money is evil or or if guns kill people then pencils misspell words. <laughs> Shoot. You know, it's like fat. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Spoon, a like salt a spoon. I saw that right, one the right, other day. Right. I saw that. I yeah. thought that was really good. I mean, these are just objects, inanimate objects, and people have to get over the idea that, well, that uh, like, they can uh, do anything thinking, without people. Um, just ahead. touching on that, uh, I think that, yes, there is, there is a lot of truth in that statement, but I think that the, uh, the core principle, the core value of a business is not to make money. And I will challenge you on that one. Because, you know, what is the purpose, for instance, you, you, you're a doctor. What's the purpose of a doctor? To yeah, help people. True. Yeah, true. To, 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 to help, uh, so yeah, have true, to, to have, help people. But doctors don't normally employ themselves. They normally are employed by a hospital or a clinic. And the clinic, its, its job is but, not to help people. It's to make money so I can pay its doctors. I, I disagree there. I think that... I think that making money is, for instance, I'm a human. Well, value is subjective here. Keep that in mind. Of course it is. Of course it is. But I, I, I think, and notice that I'm saying I think, I'm not saying it is. I think that the, the primary, um, like for instance, hospitals have mission statements. Their mission statement doesn't say we're going to make the most money for, you know, stock owners, you know, stockholders. Their mission is to whatever, you know, mission is, is to heal or to bring health or whatever. So, but money comes as a side effect. And I think John Mackey says it best when he talks about uh, whenever we go after income or profit in an indirect fashion, we end up getting more of it. Because if I come to you and I know that you're only wanting my money and try to give me a crappy service or the least amount of service possible to get my money, I'm not going to go back to you. However, if you look for, if you try to, to, to explore your gifts, if you try to uh, fulfill your calling, if you're a badass acupuncturist and you love what you do, I am going to come to you and hand you my wallet, you know, and money <laughs> will come out of, you know, like crazy. And that's kind of like a neat paradox because life is full of double buyings. You like, just got to keep, you got to keep your eye on what Danilo is actually poking you with though. I'm just saying. <laughs> Well, I was I was gonna say I was I gonna say that <laughs> I was just gonna say that Ella, make sure you make sure you remember this. I mean, we have it on video now, so the next time you see Luis, you can take him up on that. <laughs> well, no, he's gonna yeah, hand you. He's gonna hand you his wallet. <laughs> and my wallet for acupuncture, then you know, I'm sure my wife would like that too. He can have my wallet if I can keep my driver's license and my right, credit card. Let me, let me respond to Luis. Um, that's a very good point. I agree. Um, and yeah, I would say that you know, with any business, you know, you do have the your your duty is to is to make a profit but also to serve the customers right that they go hand in hand you know um and you're right you're right maybe maybe serving the customers is even more but but still they're very close right and and all i'm saying is that when people vilify profit or money you know they're really doing a disservice to um you know to private enterprise and and uh you know free trade in general because <laughs> the, the evil part I think is not that, the money so yeah oh absolutely I, I everybody has to make money and that's not the question the question is like the the the, the core value is not just to make money i'm a human but i don't live to eat you know, that's just the fuel for my life. You know, I, I, I live for other things, too. And then, like uh, Jimmy was saying, it, it's all subjective. So, I, was it you? Was it Dave? Yeah. Somebody said that it was all subjective. Yeah, so, well, I mean, Jeremy would say the same thing. No, no, I, I, I was going to agree with Luis um, because I, 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 think, I think that's right, that, that the, you know, the, the profits are actually a byproduct of providing the service in the first place. Um, yes, are there bad actors out there that's only goal is to make money? Absolutely. But, you know, we talk about this all the time, that even amongst ourselves, that, you know, the whole idea of wanting uh, to have an actually freed market is so that competition can be there and people, the whole idea is providing the best services at the most competitive prices to keep yourself in business and to keep people coming back to you. You know, that's what we preach. So that that is the idea. And, and it actually ties into that. Uh, article you posted on one of our sites the, uh, last night, Dave, the, uh, the nine words, the nine socialist words that people use all the time unknowingly, you know, greed was one of them. They, people, people mistake greed as a, for a bad thing because that's what they're programmed to believe. They're programmed to believe that people only want the money and they don't focus on the fact that if you're not providing a good service, at least in a freer market you know the the people at the top right now that have all the regulations in their favor aren't 
um, you know, they're not playing fair, obviously. <laughs> um, but when you're when you're left your own devices like that, you have to provide those services. You have to keep keep people coming back. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. There's so, like, for instance, one of one of the CEOs that we work with, he says that you know he expects out of everybody in the enterprise to provide two things: business results and servant leadership. So it's not one or the other. If you're really good at some at one but not the other, you know, they will let him go. They've let go people that make them tons of money because they were not servant leaders. So the idea of being a voluntarist, a uh, peaceful individual, that makes money is basically what they're looking for. And, and like, you know, people that follow the, this kind of uh, ideology are in the Forbes uh, 100 best companies to work for. And they're like, a lot of those are our clients. So the idea that yes, we need to make money and we want to pay the highest wages and we want to give the most perks and the most vacation. Uh, but you know, that that comes because of the service that you provide. If you're if you're a shitty person, nobody's gonna come back to your business. You know, like uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. I went to Indianapolis to a conference and I I uh, got to meet um, Howard Behar, the president of Starbucks. And I mean, obviously, I asked him for a selfie. But aside from that, what what his book was about was uh, it's not about the coffee. So you're like Starbucks, and it's not about the coffee. What the hell is this? Um, so what he goes on to explain is when you go to Starbucks, the, you know, the, the, the barista knows your name, they know what you like, they greet you, and you want to go back and you're willing to pay, you know, $2.50 for or just a black coffee that you can pay 99 cents at QT. Why? Because of the service. It's not just because, I mean, the coffee is superior in my opinion, but it's not just because of that, it's because they, they, the way you, you were treated. So by putting people first, you know, they just, they're, they're going to go back. And I mean, that's a great business, um, uh, like the way to handle business. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, it's if capitalism it, it works well when you put the customer ahead, but uh, unfortunately you can't put the customer ahead in politics. <laughs> um, I think that you probably cannot and you're right but then again i don't think that politics is a i mean politics is a filthy game when when we went to uh, austin you know for the national i mean the state convention uh i mean that we only got done like a couple of items in like two days because that stuff takes forever and then like uh, a group of the tea party people came and hijacked the nomination for governor and so she ran a tea party woman like paid well i don't want to say that she got a lot she convinced a lot of people to vote for her and suddenly it's not a libertarian running for governor but a tea party person i mean it, it is filthy it is dirty and it's tricky and and if you know the rules you can you can get your way or you know just push yourself around and and, and get things to your favor so yeah i mean it can be frustrating and, and, and it's kind of not nice like you said so i agree uh, yeah, so yeah, it's just repeating what I said before that um, if somebody were to ask me what the best thing I can do to affect change, I would not say go into politics as the first, um, as the first uh, option, right? There are so many different options I would tell people first because uh, so many people uh, just, you know, if, if, you under, if you fully understand the volunteer's philosophy and then you go into politics, that's a big difference than somebody saying, you know, I want to change the world, I'll go into politics. <laughs> I think there's a big difference there when they don't philosophically understand what is government, you know, what exactly is taxation, right? What, <laughs> right? They're like, if, if you don't really understand that first, then please do not go into politics. <laughs> please. You will be hurting more people than you will be helping. And again, I, I say this almost every episode, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And if you go into politics with good intentions and you end up hurting a lot of people and robbing a lot of people, that's still not an excuse. Like, oh, I didn't know. No. <laughs> no. First, get your head to understand the philosophy, and then, and then we'll uh, we can go from there. Yeah, or you guys can move to Texas, and we can just create here uh, some sort of libertopia with all these liberty-minded <laughs> people and guns and, and all this. You're shaking your head no, Dave. It's okay. We'll bring you. We'll, we'll put some. We'll bring you. Dave's so attached to Alabama, he, he has their school, their their college logo <laughs> tattooed on his arm. So uh, Alabama, he's not, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Be, hey, 
can my home's in Alabama. My home's in Alabama. <laughs> my heart is in Alabama. He's Not a state. He's a state statist. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, I guess I'm just because I like Texas, so that's cool. <laughs> All right. So, if anyone has any uh, any last remarks uh, before we uh, finish up. Um, yeah, like, what would you say, Luis, to somebody who would say, "What's the, what's the first thing that I can do to affect change in the world?" What would you say to somebody like that? I love Jeffrey Tucker's quote to finish this with, and he, I mean, I'm going to butcher it, but he basically says to to be an active, uh, an activist for liberty, find what you do best in any sector of life that benefits you, those around you, and and the societal uh, whatever um, around you, and do the best that you can and that is going to be the best work for liberty. So if you're, uh, you know, you're laying brick, if you're an acupuncturist, if you're a teacher, if you're whatever you are, if you do the best that you can, that's probably uh, uh, the best way to get um, government grow, out of people's beards. hands. You can grow beards, you can, <laughs> and you can play with it. And I grow beards. I grow, get I grow liberty orange. beards. <laughs> you can play with it. <laughs> I grow liberty beards, that's what I do. Beards for freedom. <laughs> So I guess if I can just plug in a couple of things, uh, my channel Emancipated Human on YouTube and the website EmancipatedHuman.com and um, uh, Luis Fernando Misses on Facebook. And I also write for the Dollar Vigilante. Uh, you can get an awesome subscription for only $15 a month. Um, and, and we do a lot of awesome things. And, and uh, I guess um, that's, that's about it. Uh, yeah, my consulting work and Maggie Cooper and Associates um, and politics here in Tarrant County, Texas, and thank you so much for having me, guys. Jeremy hasn't talked in like ten minutes. He's got to say something before the show ends. Sure. Come on, I, Jeremy. Well, I I actually unwittingly planned to say something that uh, you already stole my thunder with Jeff, with Jeffrey Tucker's quote. I actually don't know that quote, <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's just funny because that's what you know. That's what I was gonna say. It, it really comes down to what you're what you're comfortable with, you know. If if it, I can like does. Obama now. If you come, if, if you if, didn't build if, that, Luis. <laughs> I, uh, if you're if if you want to get into politics and and your, you know your mind is on abolishing things and and running on some type of platform or just helping out people that that will, then go for it. You know, if if you want to be some kind of activist in another way and that's what suits you, then then do that. You know, like like you said, it it really. It doesn't matter what it is necessarily. It's if you put the, you know, if you have the passion and you find what you feel comfortable with, you can make it your own, and you know, you just spread the message how, however you possibly can. Um, that that's about it. I well like said, that. man. Well said. Wrap us up, Danilo. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to the Seas Delivery Podcast. Um, thank you very much, Luis, for coming on. Uh, yes, if, you, if, if anybody wants to support us, you can support us uh, through Bitcoin, through Patreon, um, and we will accept any value you can throw at us. No problem. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Google volunteerism. Google volunteerism. <laughs> Read Rothbard. <laughs> Peace. Take care. Bye, Have guys. Day, thank you.